thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kang, for that uh, very nice introduction. And it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, at the second Chase Symposium uh, in honor of the uh, uh, founder and chairman of, of uh, SK. Um, I, I am the B in BTS. Um, unfortunately, um, I forgot to color my hair this morning. Um, and I can also not sing, um, unless there's karaoke and, and, and an other drink. So, um, but, but I think as you got from the previous two talks, batteries play a quite important role in society. So what I'm going to do today is I talk to you about battery technology, where it is, where it is going, why it's so important. But then towards the end, and hopefully I can keep you awake that long, because towards, I will show you a, a really, I think, new vision of the future of how we accelerate innovation uh, in this space. Uh, I am lucky to be associated uh, both with uh, UC Berkeley and LBNL, where there is a very large ecosystem of people doing computational modeling, working in energy storage, working in AI. So it's an extremely uh, productive environment uh, in that space. Um, just to tell you who we are, um, we're sort of a group of about 40 students and postdocs, but like I said, we are embedded in a much larger uh, ecosystem. Uh, what's maybe a bit unusual about us is that um, we kind of mix uh, a lot of fundamental science also into applied science. So while we have large applied programs on energy storage, we have people who worry about quantum mechanics, we have people who worry about AI in the group, uh, and that creates a sort of intellectually very stimulating environment that on occasion allows us uh, to do something new. Um, so uh, one of the reasons I think um, that everybody's so interested in batteries that if you look at the outlook of the world, and I've taken as an example here the BP Energy Outlook Report that predicts that by 2040, 70% uh, uh, of all primary energy growth, so primary energy is basically all the energy inputs to the world, whether it's for heating or for uh, industry, but 70% uh, of that will be for electricity generation. Uh, that's a remarkably large number, right? Today, electricity is only about 30% of primary energy use. Um, and 40% of that primary energy growth will be satisfied, will be renewables, right? Which is really meaning, if you read it carefully, more than half of all the growth in electricity will be satisfied, will be renewables. 30% uh, of all miles driven will be electric. That does not mean 30% of all cars will be electric, but there if we believe in autonomous driving and if that will go electric, the miles that people actually drive will be he heavily electrified. Okay, so it shows you that energy storage is needed at all scales, right? We store energy to carry our laptops and phones around. Now you have cordless uh, power tools that are actually much better than the ones you plug into the wall. Um, we have the, the, the first generation of electric cars, and we see energy storage appearing even where we didn't think it would appear, in the grid. And these days there are massive, there are very large programs even in the aerospace industry. The areas that if you had said this in the battery field 20 years ago, that we were going to worry about batteries in airplanes, people would have laughed you out of the room. But today we see it appear for short haul flights, at one hour to two hour flight uh, is an enormous interest in electric flight because of efficiency, because of pollution, and because of noise control. For example, one benefit of electric flight is that you may be able to land in airports when the airport is closed because of noise, or so between midnight and 6 a.m. in many city airports. Um, but even the grid, the grid was one of these topics where people did not even want to talk about electric energy storage. Here is uh, in April 2019, the load curve for one day, I think this is April 1, uh, this is the load curve, the amount of electricity used to, throughout the day in California. But the blue curve is actually the generation we need because the rest is made up by solar. So this difference here is all the solar that's active in that's active in California today. This is not planned solar. This is already active today. And I know that in the back you cannot see the scale, but it's important. This is in thousands of megawatts, so gigawatt. And if you don't know what a gigawatt is, a large power plant, a really large power plant is about a gigawatt, a big nuclear power plant. Many 
you know, uh, gas-fired power plants is smaller. So this dip here, from up here to down here, that's 10 massive power plants you need to shut down between about 7 in the morning and noon. And then you've just shut them down. You need to ramp them back up in three to four hours. This is how bad or how good, depending on your point of perspective, the electricity situation is now in California state with solar energy. This is not only California's future, right? I don't know if you read about a $13 billion solar plant being built in, in the Middle East. They will have exactly the same issues, right? We are not talking about building many gigawatts of solar. We're not talking about 10 megawatts anymore. The solar plants being built are of the order of, of many gigawatts. One thing that I want to stress that this looks like an impossible problem, but if you do the math that with today's cost of energy storage, moving sort of cutting this valley in half and moving storage from here to here would take about uh, would take about 13 uh, would take about uh, 20, 20 to 25 gigawatt hour. So in money, that's about 20, 30 billion dollars. That may seem like a lot, but the revenue of all electricity companies in California today is about 35 billion dollars. So if you think of doing this over the next 10 years, this is not such an impossible problem. So when people tell you that we don't know how to do, deal with the intermittency of wind and solar, it's actually not true. With today's numbers of what's already available, on the market, it's actually already possible. So the question is, what technology does it? You know, small stuff is all lithium ion, and this is already an, an amazing progression. Lithium ion, which was developed for portable electronics, has already moved into systems that are a thousand times bigger in terms of storage volume. You know, your phone is about 10 watt hour, cars are many tens of kilowatt hour. But now we're actually going into the grid as well, uh, which is another scale of a thousand. So between the original invention of lithium ion to where we now put lithium ion, it's a million times bigger. So this is a technology that essentially in application scale has gone up by a factor of a million and it's still largely the same technology. Um, again, to show you that this is being done, here's the Tesla plant, 129 megawatt hour in Hornsdale, South Australia. Uh, th this is the one where Elon Musk made a bet with the Australian government that he could build it in a certain amount of time. I forgot what it was, eight months, 12 months, and he did. Uh, in its first year, it made $25 million in arbitrage. That's specific to Australia because Australia has very highly fluctuating energy prices, and the plant cost about uh, $69 million. Uh, this is in our own state, California. Uh, California is planning a, about three, uh, about two megawatt, uh, about two gigawatt hour of energy storage to replace gas peaker plants. And there's a few things you should notice. What's the technology? It's all lithium ion. But there's another thing that's important on this graph. This was approved in 2019 by the legislator. Look, if you can read it, the online date. Basically, this is like December 2020, October 2019, December 2020. You can build a lithium ion energy storage plant online a year. It can be online a year after you've gotten approval. You can never do this with many other industrial technologies, right? You cannot build a power plant. You can definitely not build a nuclear power plant in a year. Um, and so here's another advantage of electrochemical uh, energy storage technology. All you need is... A, Oops, all you need is a, is, a concrete, is a concrete pad and you put essentially a bunch of uh, batteries on it. So to me, I always compare lithium as the silicon of the battery industry. Everybody always says it will be replaced, but it's really hard to replace. It's the incumbent technology, it's remarkably powerful. It has come down in price tremendously and it has gone enormous market growth, right? In 2000, we barely had two gigawatt hour of production. Today, we're probably around 200 gigawatt hour. And people are projecting that, that in 2028, we may produce one terawatt hour uh, of lithium ion battery technology. So uh, what are the challenges if you go to a terawatt hour? Um, they definitely will be appearing. 
the main issue will come on the cathode side. Uh, it is probably not the lithium ion side, but um, cathodes in the battery field has always been winner takes all. Once we have a good cathode, we kind of make it for almost everything with minor variations. And today the winning technology is what's called, uh, oops, what's called the NMC series. NM, N stands for nickel, M for manganese, C for cobalt, and essentially depending on the application, we mix them in different ratio. Electronics is still pure lithium cobalt oxide, early plug-in electric vehicles were NMC 111, which means equal amounts of each. And now the standard bearer in automotive is what's called NMC 622, which is 60% nickel, 20% manganese, 20% copper. And people want to go to even higher nickel content like 811 and 955. And that's mainly A, to replace cobalt, which there is not a lot of in production. We produce about 120,000 tons of cobalt in the world, and it's more expensive. But higher nickel content also gives you a slightly higher energy density, actually not that much. But I want to put this in perspective because we don't want to get lost in the fight between more cobalt or more nickel. Whatever you're going to use, cobalt or nickel, if you want a terawatt hour of lithium ion production in the world, you will need about one million ton of one of these metals or two of these metals combined. It doesn't really matter which one. With cobalt, that's impossible. The cobalt production today is about 120,000 ton a year. Nickel production is about 2.2 million ton a year. So if you want to make a terawatt of lithium ion, you're going to need 40% of the world's nickel production. So now you are competing with the building industry, stainless steel. Right? Stainless steel is today the biggest user of nickel. Uh, you are competing with everybody who uses nickel in stainless steel, in catalyst, in all kinds of alloys. And what are we going to do if we need two terawatt hours, right? Now we're sort of well beyond what is even known about the pro production capability of, of nickel. So this is something to keep in mind. You're fine for now, but not for much longer. So where does this problem come from? Why are we so reliant on, on, on cobalt and nickel? Uh, and here I have to dig a little into the, into the material science. All cathodes today are layered structures. They're, here's a cartoon of them. They're essentially oxygen layers with either a metal in between, so that would be nickel or cobalt, and then lithium. And what you do when you charge a battery, what's so brilliant about the lithium ion technology is that you sort of pull lithium out, you pull it out and you deposit it on the other electrode, which is graphite. And then when you discharge it, you bring that back. Unfortunately, with most metals, what happens, so you create all this empty space in the material because you want to pull a lot of lithium ion out because that gives you a lot of capacity per unit weight and volume. And what happens is that these other metals start to move around. And when they move around, they have high valence, so they contract the oxygen layers around them. And what that actually does is it actually kills the mobility of lithium because lithium needs to kind of move around here to get out on some side. And as these oxygen layers contract, um, lithium can actually not get out anymore and your battery has no rate capability anymore. So you can effectively not charge or discharge it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, a funny tidbit here, uh, it was actually one of your colleagues, Professor Kisu Kang, who when he was working in my group, who kind of actually figured out this problem. Uh, maybe not the solution, but they figured out this problem now uh, almost 14 uh, uh, years ago. So uh, that means that if you work with today's cathodes, you basically can't use most of the periodic table. Basically, you can use cobalt, nickel, and actually manganese, not really, because you cannot use it in an electroactively useful state. You can only use it as a stabilizer. So. While people always tell me, you know, I design materials, people tell me there's so many possibilities to mix things, and so I usually tell them there's not enough, right? Because here's a basic physical limitation. You cannot engineer this away. This has to do with the electronic structure of the elements. You cannot engineer this away. If you work with today's cathodes, you will need cobalt and nickel, and to some extent manganese. So either you're willing to live with that, and you're going to find where you open up your next uh, nickel mines or you take over the Philippines, um, but otherwise there is no uh, option here. So the question is, how do we break this curse so that we can go to cheaper and even more energy storage technology? 
So this is where computational materials design came in. That's a, a field that I've been in for a long time. Uh, the computational material science is sort of um, when you're a young student in, in college, it's your dream, right? You learn all this quantum mechanics and physics and you wonder what it's all useful for. And you go like, well, we understand all the quantum mechanics. Can't we solve the equations and predict everything in the world, right? And, and, and we can't predict everything in the world, but what we have learned to do in the last 30 years is that we got very good at predicting materials properties. So that means that today you can build a virtual laboratory. You can essentially come up with ideas, make calculations on these hypothetical materials and predict things about them. That's a field that grew tremendously in the 1980s and 1990s, as I, just as I finished, uh, had finished my PhD. And what we added to that uh, later on is then realize, well, anything you can compute, you can easily compute many times. Because computing is one of the easiest things to scale. You write some scripts, and now you suddenly, instead of calculating it once, you calculate it 1,000 times, 10,000 times. It just depends on how much computer power you have. And that's what we did in the mid 2000s. We developed what was called high throughput computing to the point where we now sometimes in a few days kind of evaluate a property across all known inorganic compounds, really all known inorganic compounds. There are something like 100,000 known inorganic compounds. If we really want to, and you say, I want the dielectric constant, you can have it in a week if you give us the computers. Okay, that led to the Materials Project, which is led by my colleague, uh, Christine Person at UC Berkeley and LBL, which today is the most used computational materials design environment in the world. It, it has multiple thousands of users access it every day. It is also the largest source of data that is used for AI-driven efforts uh, in material science. Um, it's led to developing new ionic conductors, new cathodes, new TCOs, and so. So um, where I want to go with this is uh, how do we design novel cathodes with this? So the whole idea was to understand that if you want to make layered cathodes, um, there's really not much you can do. You can try to make the NMC materials today better, uh, but you will always be stuck with this limited chemistry. So our idea was, well, you know, let's forget about layered cathodes. I don't care about the cations being ordered. I'm just going to let them disorder. So I'm going to work with what nature gives me, but I'm going to try to make that work as a cathode. If I can do that, I can use the whole periodic table, not just cobalt and nickel. And that's what we did um, in, um, sorry, in about 2014, I worked with uh, a Korean graduate student, Jin Yuk Lee from Seoul National here, who was doing his PhD with me. And what we understood was that we looked in with great care at the diffusion mechanism. How does lithium actually diffuse in these kind of materials? And we found that if we disordered materials, that there's some environment that would appear where lithium is surrounded only by other lithiums. And we, we found, and this would get a little more technical to explain, that that environment was very independent of structure. Lithium would essentially always be able to go through whether the structure was small or big or whatever. And so all we needed to do was create a cathode in which we had enough of these environments so that they would percolate through the structure in a statistical way. And that's sort of what you see here. This is actually a disordered material. It's a crystalline material, but the cations are all over the place. So they're not these perfect layers. And this shows you the statistical percolation of how lithium can actually move through there. So now we have a material Rather than having well-defined diffusion paths, the lithium can diffuse through there in a sort of fairly random way, but it can go through. The first proof came in this material, uh, which uh, Jin Yuk Lee worked on and was published in Science in 2014, which this is actually a material that starts as a layered material. You can actually see the microscopy here. You see the perfect layering. But after one cycle, it became uh, uh, almost completely disordered, but it still worked. This is actually a discharge curve and a charge curve, and it has very high capacity. So this was the proof that you could make disordered materials and that they would actually work really well. Again, that's an interesting academic tidbit, but the real reason that that's important is that this now opened up chemical space. So today in the literature, there are tons of disordered rock salt cathodes 
and we only stopped collecting this in 2018. And what you see is there's now all kinds of other chemistries, manganese, there's iron, titanium, there's molybdenum, there's niobium, uh, there's chromium, uh, there's oxyfluorides chemistry. So suddenly we have a lot more chemical flexibility to make uh, new cathodes. And this is Im important from the resource perspective, but these cathodes also have very high energy content. So if you look at some of these materials, we can up get up to 1,000 watt hours per kilogram, 300 milliamp hours per gram. Um, uh, though the voltage profile is quite different on layered cathodes materials, so if we're going to use this, we will have to do some things somewhat differently uh, in, in batteries. Um, they have quite good uh, cycle life, have we learned now, uh, although that's not been tested in any sort of large-scale commercial cell. But they also have some remarkable attributes because they can be fluorinated. Your classic battery cathode today in your phone, in your car, cannot be fluorinated. Um, these can be fluorinated, and, and, and fluorine in electrochemistry, fluorine is one of the, the, the most useful elements but it, because it is so hard to pull an electron of fluorine. And, and so it creates extremely stable environments. So most cathodes are oxides today, and oxygen can actually be you can pull electrons of oxygen, we make oxygen unstable, and that's actually one of the negative reactions in a battery. Then oxygen gets released and it burns the electrolyte. The electrolyte is an organic solvent, um, which burns easily when it's exposed to oxygen radicals. So here you see an oxyfluoride cathode, which is being charged to very high voltage, to five volt, and this is the amount of oxygen coming off. We put this in an apparatus where you can actually see the gas come off and, and look at the gas. And this is compared to a normal oxide cathode where if you hit 4.3 volt, we already see quite a lot of oxygen come off. So these materials are very high, very stable to high charge and will therefore uh, likely be safer as well. So today there have been a lot of these oxyfluoride, DRX as we call them now, disordered rock salts, developed all with very high energy density. Um, but one thing I want to say, right, this is very exciting and this is very intriguing, but it takes a long time for materials to make it all the way through commercialization. And I'll come back to that point later that even when we have good things in the lab, when you go to industry with this, there are, you know, a material that somebody wants to buy from you, I've learned, has to be good in almost all ways. You can't just be an academic and say, well, it's good in this, but not in that. But to make a product, everything has to be right. And so there's a lot of steps here to be taken before you can commercialize something like this. And I'll come back to that in the end. But basically the important thing of this, this invention is that I think it allowed us to unlock the chemistry and resolve the resource problem for lithium ion batteries in the future. So, so the question is, can we go beyond lithium ion? Will lithium, will lithium ion truly be the silicon of the battery industry? Uh, and, and still be used 20 years later. So um, there are various directions one can go here. Uh, I think it's going to be very hard to find a technology that supersedes lithium ion in every capability, but that may not be needed. So depending on whether you want low cost or higher safety or higher energy by volume or higher energy by weight, you may want to pick a different technology. So for lower cost, there are things like sodium ion and potassium ion, and I'll say a few words about this, which is really intriguing, and I think maybe not enough attention uh, uh, paid to them. Uh, I think on specific capacities, so this is where weight is important, like in airplanes, uh, lithium sulfur might be particularly interesting, maybe lithium air. Uh, on high energy density um, and high safety, there are probably things like magnesium ion, and in particular solid state lithium, uh, which are probably uh, uh, of some interest. So I'll quickly walk through some of them. I'll, I, don't, I don't really want to discuss these. These are not really in my area of expertise so much. Um, so uh, sodium ion, uh, in my opinion, sodium ion is, a, is something that the industry really should spend more time on because it is really uh, uh, a great replacement for sodium ion when you are const, co conscious of cost and resources. Uh, the reason is um, a sodium ion battery looks just like a lithium ion battery, except with sodium. So you can manufacture it on existing uh, infrastructure. You don't have to build new factories. But there are three main advantages. The cost of sodium is much less than the cost of lithium. 
but on the cathode side, right, where you have to buy cobalt and nickel to make cathodes, there are many cathodes for sodium that, is, that don't contain cobalt and in many cases don't even contain nickel. So today already a third of the price and sometimes more of a lithium ion battery is set by the cost of the cathode. And that will likely not go down that price. So on, in, a, in a sodium system, you could imagine really inexpensive cathodes. Uh, you can use aluminum current collectors instead of copper, and they function in many cases at very high rate. Uh, I think our frustration is that, um, um, that the reason that sometimes I think industry has paid very little attention to this so far is that lithium ion is so dominant today, it works so well, uh, and if your time horizon is five years, maybe even ten, and we could argue whether a company should have a five or ten year horizon, that's probably fine. You will be selling lithium ion batteries in five years still. In the long term, though, sodium looks like a really attractive technology for low cost applications like grid. Um, other applications, for example, uh, one that's, that I've worked on quite a bit is magnesium ion. Uh, this is farther out as a technology, but the real interesting benefit potential for magnesium that it could have really superior energy density, so by volume. So uh, in applications where you care by, of energy by volume is things like portable electronics, uh, automotive, uh, and that's because the magnesium anode has an extremely high capacity density. It stores an enormous amount of charge per unit volume. Uh, we work on this in the Joint Center for uh, Energy Storage, uh, and there has been progress, but progress in this area is slow. Uh, the original uh, battery was built in 2000 by Doran Auerbach, who showed for the first time that you could cycle magnesium quite well in this molybdenum sulfide. Uh, and actually, this battery could be cycled several thousand times. So off the bat, this cycled already better than lithium at the time. This was the year 2000. Uh, lithium ion actually could not do uh, 2000 cycles at the time. But since then, um, Two things were needed, electrolytes to raise the voltage of this and better cathodes to get the energy density up. I would say that the electrolyte work has made tremendous progress. If you haven't followed it, today we have electrolytes that can go to four volt. Uh, and so really what we're missing is a good cathode. Uh, we have done enormous uh, computational work in this area. The biggest problem in making a good cathode for magnesium is that because it's a divalent ion and has two charges on it, it's really very hard to make it move quickly through a host, which is what you need to do charge and discharge. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, working together with a group in Waterloo, we at least came up with one new cathode, the uh, sulfide spinel, which cycles extremely well, doubles the capacity of the current uh, magnesium battery technology at a similar voltage. Uh, but this is still, while this is great, this is still too low to be competitive. But maybe one number that you have not realized, this cell has the largest capacity density of any cell ever made. It's even, in, so it's not energy density, it's capacity density. It's much larger than a lithium ion cell. So to translate that to higher energy density, we would actually have to be able to raise the voltage, right? Because volt, energy is voltage times capacity. Uh, and that has still, is still a challenge so far. So finally, I want to say a few words about solid state uh, lithium ion, which is really all the rage. Uh, uh, everybody's very excited about solid state, uh, probably for good, very good reasons. And there are two reasons to go to solid state. Uh, one is safety and one is energy density. Again, uh, we're all familiar with uh, uh, all, uh, several safety incident, uh, the Boeing 787 one, the ne Samsung Note 7 one, which is probably the two most expensive safety incidents uh, we've had in the battery industry. If you remember, this led to the recall of essentially every Note 7 phone. You can only imagine what that cost. Um, uh, hoverboard fires, this was, usually, this was largely due to uh, improperly manufactured batteries uh, in these cheaper devices. But What's common in most safety incidents is that uh, the, the origin of fire is actually the electrolyte combustion. So the electrolyte is an organic solvent. Uh, if anything uh, causes a flame or heats it up, the uh, organic electrolyte essentially uh, catches fire and then heats up the rest of the cell and burns the rest of the cell. And the reason is it is an organic solvent. It's essentially gasoline, right, the, the, the electrolyte. And so the, the, what, the, the, what the field wants to do is replace the organic liquid electrolyte by a solid which cannot burn. 
and then we would make a full solid device, sort of like a, like a semiconductor device. There would be no liquids, no moving parts. We would just have all solids in the battery. Um, so we would do that mainly for safety, um, but there's a, a feeling in the field that we can also get much higher energy density. That's still somewhat under debate, but I want to sort of show you where our projections put that. If you put a classic lithium ion battery today at 600 watt hours per liter, uh, we like this unit of energy per volume because that's probably one of the most important ones, uh, not per weight. Uh, my prediction is that solid state will come out at the same energy density because it will probably use very similar electrodes, but that there is a curve here where you move up. Uh, solid state might enable the lithium metal anode. If you remember, today a lithium battery uses graphite as the anode, but you might be able to use the lithium metal anode and that will make the big jump from 600 to probably of the area of 1,000 watt hours per liter. Um, we think you can over time go higher by modifying the cathode, you would use cathodes that are not possible in liquid electrolytes, sorry, my pointer's running away here, uh, cathodes that are not usable in liquid electrolytes and then even go what's called anodeless. And best case scenario, we think you can reach 1400 watt hours per liter. So solid state will not do that on day one, but it is essentially a new trajectory for lithium ion. It is a trajectory that may actually lead to ultimately doubling the energy density. You should not expect that on year one. Uh, again, the battery industry is remarkably conservative and will, will probably come out here and only market uh, the safety issue. Um, there is much you can do. There is much work and problems to be solved on lithium ion. Uh, these have been said many times. You need very good ionic conductors. Uh, to, to, you need solids that transport lithium ions very well. Oops. Uh, you need to work with a lithium metal anode, which, which tends to force itself through the electrolyte and short it. You now have a cathode that is made out of, of, of um, electrolyte, carbon, and solid state conductor. There are no liquids, so you have problems that when the cathode breathes, it swells and contracts, that you lose contact. So there's all these kind of practical issues that still have to be fully resolved uh, in the industry. Uh, we work on all these components, but the one I really wanted to show briefly is that our computational modeling is extremely well suited to work uh, to find really good ionic conductors. You can actually simulate ionic conductivity directly. And in some sense, we can probably simulate it now faster and better than doing experimental measurements. And that has actually led to the discovery of, um, let me go a little faster here, to the discovery of actually multiple novel uh, ionic conductors, either for lithium and sodium. And several of these actually have been made in the lab and validated, and in some cases very quickly. This conductor was discovered in 2011 and was already validated in 2013. So a much faster way for us to get uh, into, uh, into developing new materials. You can actually make batteries. This is actually a charge, this charge curve of a fully uh, solid state cell. Okay, but what I wanna end with is a few slides that, that are maybe seem unrelated to the battery field, but, but hopefully um, that relation will be clear in the end. That my frustration is that in the end that while we have gotten better at the design of materials, uh, progress in materials development is way too slow in general. And that's why companies are scared of it. Um, you know, materials development and leading materials into commercialization is often a 20 year effort. And if something takes 20 years, it's really hard to find people to put money into it. Actually, um, Tom Eager, uh, who was a long time ago department head at, um, at MIT, quali he quantified this for some real materials, things like Teflon and Velcro and uh, titanium alloys, and found that on average, the development time for commercialization was 18 years for materials. So it's actually in many cases worse than pharmaceuticals and medical drugs. Um, lithium ion has actually been ahead of the curve. The first lithium battery was made in 1976 by Stan Whittingham, who is one of the Nobel Prize winners. And cons commercialization essentially started in 1991. So lithium ion batteries was all, only about 15 years. Um, and to, to address this problem, um, um, 
we worked uh, in 2011 with the Office of Science and Technology Policy of, of then President Obama to come up with what's called, the, what became the Materials Genome Initiative, and it was really to develop software and computational tools, new methods, open standards and databases to make discovery and development of materials faster and less expensive and more predictable. I think this, um, this initiative has been remarkably successful uh, but maybe only on the front end of development. Um, we, are, we have become extremely good at design. Today, we can actually computationally design almost anything you want. The problem is then, after you design it, you have to make it, you have to characterize, and you have to test it, and that's where we spend all our time today. So imagine that you, know, you have a good idea for a new conductor or a new dielectric, so that's your design. Now you have to make it, see if it's, did you make the right thing, and then does it have the right properties? And in many cases, what do you do, right? Oh, no, you didn't quite make what you wanted to make, so you have to iterate back. Oh, you, it, you made what you thought you wanted to make, and now you test it, and it doesn't really have what you want, and you iterate back. And if you look at a materials design exercise, you go many times through this loop. And time is essentially number of cycles you go through it times time per cycle. So the question is, how do we do this better, right? How do we do this where it doesn't take 20 years? You know, if it takes 20 years, I can only do three materials in my academic career, and I think I want to do more. So how do you decrease the number of cycles? For that, we have to be smarter, right? If we learn more, if we're smarter, maybe if we learn how to do synthesis better, maybe we can do less of this loop. If we learn how to predict better, maybe we can do less of this loop. But how do you decrease the number of times per cycle? You know, what was amazing when I got into computation, we were, we were, we were floated by the enormous increase in computing power. I saw the difference in how people work because computers got 10 times faster, 100 times faster. In experimental research, we have not had that. You know, doing experimental research today takes almost the same amount of time than it took 20 years ago. It is still largely the same process. So to be faster, I think we will need to start thinking of things like robotics in scientific research. To be smarter, we will have to try to think about using AI in academic research. So I'm not talking about doing research on AI. I'm talking about using AI to think of our scientific research process. So let me give you an example of how we envisage the lab of the future. And I apologize for my extremely limited way, uh, ways that I can make cartoons. Um, I spend many hours on this, so, <laughs> so please do not make fun of me. So imagine that I have my great design machine here, right? I could now input that to some chemical handler. And these exist today, right? You can have liquid handlers, power handlers. If I tell it to make a certain composition, this handler can put all the precursors together. That's not a problem. So then I make a sample or a batch of samples, right? Is the great animation, right? I have to put that in the furnace, right? Today, that's a graduate student. A graduate student takes some sample, you know, puts that in the furnace. Okay, then it's done in the furnace. I have to put it in the diffractometer, right? And uh, they usually let that sit overnight, even though they don't have to, but at some point they want to go and eat. And so, uh, and then of course comes the hard part. Now comes data out. What do I do with data? That a human has to look at the data, okay? A human has to look at it, which means this was done at 3 a.m. in the morning, but now it's like really, I was gonna say 8 a.m. when the student comes in, it's really 11 a.m. when the student comes in and looks at the data. And now the student has, oh, has to decide, hmm, I didn't make what I wanted to make, so I gotta change something, right? So really, if you wanna automate this loop, what you need to do is you need to have some smart decision making here. So you need some kind of AI that takes output and decides what the next step is to take. If you can do this, if you can build this fully automated lab, so you have robotics to do the manual operations, but don't forget this step, right? This is robotics, but this is knowledge gathering, right? If you can do this, you can build a lab where you go to iteration multiple times a day. I have seen prototypes of this, and it is not unreasonable to expect that you do innovation 100 times faster. So this is the problem, right? Today, we've gotten great at computing, we've gotten great even at AI, but in the end, humans go in the lab and humans are slow. Humans don't work 24 hours. Uh, 
humans don't log their behavior, right? Robots do. So I think what we have to build if we want to innovate faster is this automated lab of the future. So um, I think that if you do this, I think this will become the competitive advantage in research. You know, in the past, the competitive advantage was money and smart people. But if I build a lab that can do things 100 times faster, I will be better than you, whatever the money you have, whatever the smart people, because I can try things. So I saw a prototype of this uh, that I held built, and you know, the people were ready to go home. It was 4 p.m. I won't tell you which company this is, um, where they go home at 4 p.m. But you know what they do? Before they went home, they sat around and said, what will we make overnight? And they just type in some commands to the computer, and 24 samples ran overnight and were analyzed by the time they came back in the morning. Imagine that now you have the AI loop on that where, you know, at midnight it says, hmm, this experiment wasn't working so well, I'm going to modify it. Now, in the morning, they don't just have a result, they might have the result that they were asking for. Okay. So, we have roboticized, if that's a word, robotized. Um, we have company, we have robotized the way we make things in companies, if you look at an assembly line of cars, but we have not used that same kind of idea in research. And of course, on an assembly line, it's easier. There are predefined tasks. What is so much harder in research is that you, you, you need from humans to be flexible, right? When the outcome is this, you need to do that. When the outcome is something else, you need to do something else. But I think that with modern AI, we can actually build in uh, that flexibility. So this is what we're very excited about uh, in UC Berkeley and something we are planning to build. We already have done a little bit of that. We have built machine learning and AI that can essentially read papers for you. So we have built an engine that can read papers and essentially tell us what's in it. And sometimes it's really good the way it does it. One thing that we have trained it really well on, it can tell us recipes to make materials. So we have read 4 million papers by machine reading, and essentially, from that we have extracted codified recipes. Right? So these are recipes that a computer can work with. It knows what the ingredients are to make something. It knows the operations to do. OK, sorry. And it actually knows, so instead of text, which a computer cannot do anything with, right? Computer doesn't really want to use words and interpret them. We have codified recipes. So have we, we have synthesis of materials now out of 4 million papers in flowcharts. So you can imagine how you would use this, right? You would use this to drive robots. If, if, if I want to tell my robot how to make lithium titanate, it now knows exactly what to do, okay? Because it has the recipes out of the literature. Uh, and so we have very large data sets on how to actually make materials. Okay, let me end with that because I believe my time is up. Uh, um, I started this presentation with energy storage because, you know, when you talk about social benefits, uh, energy storage is obviously one of them, right? There will be no clean energy revolution uh, without energy storage. But I hope I also gave you the message that this is already very much possible. We are not really that far away from having a clean electricity production. Um, lithium is the thousand pound gorilla in the room. It has shown an enormous ability to renew itself, to make itself better, to make itself cheaper. And so as you come up with alternative technologies, you have to keep in mind, uh, resource constraints will be real. I am not the right person to tell you whether they can be overcome. You'd have to talk to your experts in mining and so, but they are real. We will need an enormous amount of metal to store all the electricity we want to store. Uh, and that's why we looked into these novel DRX cathodes. Uh, solid state lithium is an exciting new technology. It will probably not be cheap on day one, which means it probably will be introduced in portable electronics. Uh, but I, I also made some gen more general comments that I think, you know, as we look towards the future, I think the winners will be those that can accelerate the innovation path, right? Today, the innovation path for materials is way too long. You know, our joke used to be that it is the third company that owns the startup that makes the money. The first one loses the money, the second one loses the money, and when the third one finally buys it and 15 years have gone by, that's when anybody uh, makes the money. And we are planning to do that with a combination of modeling, robotics, uh, and AI. So with that, I thank you for your attention.